In this video, we're going to look at velocity in two and three dimensions. Where now, if you believed me when I said don't memorize equations but memorize words, it really starts paying off. Because to understand velocity in two and three dimensions, you just have to go back to the original definition. The velocity is the derivative of the position with respect to time. The rest is just understanding how vectors work. Let's say we have a position as a function of time in vector form here shown in component form. It's in two dimensions, but if three dimensions, there's just an extra term in the z direction. Let's focus on two for now. The velocity then is just the derivative of the position function. So if I plug in what the position function is, I just have the derivative operation on each term, which is distributive. So I just bring in the derivative, and I end up taking the derivative of the x component with respect to time to get the x component of the velocity, and the derivative of the y component of the position to get the y component of the velocity. The one question that students sometimes ask, they get confused about the i hat and j hat, but they're simply constants, so when you do differentiation, you treat them like constants. The only point is they have to stay there, you have to keep your components. And after you take the derivatives, your new functions are your components of your velocity. For example, in the last video on position in two and three dimensions, we had a position function that looked like this. The 2t was the x component as a function of time. The y component was 9 halves t minus 5t squared. To calculate the velocity, I just calculate the derivatives of each component. The derivative of 2t is 2. The derivatives of 9 half t is 9 halves, and the derivative of negative 5t squared is negative 10t. Great, but let's take a look on how that applies to the specific event, as well as the motion diagram that is associated with it, so you can build your intuition on what these functions mean. I'm going to replay the video for which these position and velocity functions correspond. Let's turn that video into a motion diagram. Here I have a series of frames, each separated by about 1 15th of a second, and I've identified the object as a point in each frame. I have a coordinate system that allows me to quantify the system. I've put the origin at the location of the first dot. Now I can do away with the picture altogether, and I have my motion diagram in two-dimensional Cartesian space x and y. These are the position vectors for each point in space. You can see how the position vector changes as a function of time. Next, we want to calculate the displacement. A displacement vector is a final position minus an initial position. So if I have this final position shown here in pink, and I add that to the negative position of the one right before it, I get the displacement vector, which happens to point from the initial position to the final position. The displacement between two points in time is related to the average velocity. The average velocity is just that displacement divided by the time interval. Here I've drawn each displacement between each two points in time. And that displacement can also represent the average velocity because they're simply proportional to each other. So now we can see how the velocity is changing. Does this correspond to what this mathematical representation for the velocity is telling us? Well, this mathematical representation tells us that the x component of the velocity isn't changing. It's constant at 2 meters per second. Well, is that true? I simply copied all of those velocity vectors all on a vertical line. And so the question is, is the x component of each of these vectors the same? And you know, it's not exactly the same, but you can see for the most part, the x component of all of those vectors are pretty close to each other. Well, of course, the y component of the vector is changing quite dramatically. It starts large, and it's getting smaller, and that corresponds to a constant positive value of 9 halves, but it gets smaller as it starts subtracting negative 10t. Eventually, the y component reaches zero at about a half a second, then it starts getting smaller and eventually goes negative as the negative 10t term dominates.
To look at this a little deeper, let's look at the actual curve of the path as it travels through position space. I've drawn kind of a rough curve through all the points. One thing to notice is that each of the velocity vectors are tangent to the curve where they're calculated. I've blown up a part of the graph here. Let's look specifically at this velocity vector. One thing to point out is that if you know that velocity vector on this position graph, x versus y, then you can find the components of the velocity directly from that vector using basic trigonometry. If you know this angle, then the magnitude cosine theta would give you the x component, the magnitude sine theta would give you the y component, the opposite, of course, if you knew that angle. Notice that this vector is tangent to the curve at this point, which means if you have this curve in position space, y versus x, the tangent of this curve gives you the direction of the velocity at any point. Let's take a look at that. Remember how we analyzed graphs when we were doing one-dimensional motion? We can do the same thing with each component of motion in two and three dimensions. So for example, here I have the x component of the position as a function of time, which we know is a line, and it's given by 2 times t. And we also know that the slope, which is the same everywhere, since it's a straight line, gives you the magnitude of that component of the velocity, which is just 2. Here I have the y component as a function of time, which is an upside-down parabola. And we know that the slope of the tangent line at each point of the curve then gives us the component of the velocity at that point. It starts positive, it goes to zero, and then becomes negative. So analyzing x component versus time and the y component versus time is just like how we analyzed graphs versus time in one dimension. But the curve we were looking at just a minute ago is something different. This is the trajectory in two position dimensions, y versus x. This is actually tracing out the path of the object that you would see when you watch the movie. Now I understand in this case it looks a whole lot like the y versus time, but that's just a coincidence because the x versus time is linear. The point is, while this is y as a function of time, this is y as a function of x, an actual picture of the trajectory as you would see in the movie. So when you have a curve in y versus x, the slope on that curve is telling you the direction of the velocity at that point. In the final minute, let's do a typical example of the type of question you might see. Here is the position function, it could be anything, and you're asked, what is the speed at one second? Well, we know that position is the derivative of the velocity, and we can calculate that derivative, which we've already done. The derivative of 2t is 2, 9 halves t minus 5t squared is 9 halves minus 10t. And now we can calculate the velocity at t is equal to 1 second, which is 2 i hat minus 11 j hat. That's just substituting 1 in for t. And now the speed is the magnitude of the velocity, so I need to find the magnitude of that vector, which is 2 squared, 4 plus 11 halves squared, which is 121 fourths. My calculator tells me that's 5.85 meters per second. 